Hello, it's Randy Rhodes. Here's a clip from our show and go to randyrhodes.com for the whole thing and a podcast. Buy a stinking podcast. Knock. Who's there? It's a figment hey. of your imagination. The Randy Rhodes Show. Turn up your mind. The president has been busy on Twitter this morning. He defended his attorney general, Jeff Sessions. But it is a series of tweets where he accuses President Obama of wiretapping Trump Tower that is getting all the attention. Let's show them to you first. Uh, Trump tweeting terrible. Just found out that Obama had my wires tapped in Trump Tower just before the victory. Nothing found. This is McCarthyism. He followed up with this. It is illegal for a sitting president to be wiretapping a race for president prior to an election turned down by court earlier a new low. Then he tweeted, I'd bet a good lawyer could make a great case out of the fact (laughs) that President Obama was tapping my phones in October just prior to the, the election. He wasn't done. One more. Finally tweeting, how low has President Obama gone to tap my phones during the very sacred election process? This is Nixon slash Watergate, bad or sick guy. Four tweets in total accusing the Obama administration of tapping Donald Trump at Trump Tower during the campaign. At this point, the White House has not provided any context or proof to back up the president's claims. We've reached out to both the Trump and Obama administrations for their responses to these tweets. Martin, we haven't got anything back yet, but we will update as soon as we get those responses. Okay, that was Saturday morning. That was uh, early, early Saturday morning. That's how the day started. I said, where's the Excedrin? Where? It's going to be a long ass weekend. All right. So this is, and and then of course, after he tweets, you know, uh, terrible, terrible, just found out Obama had my wires tapped and spelled it wrong. I I swear this is the first dictator who's stupider than his followers. Uh, It just, it's an amazing thing. But uh, okay, uh, my wires tapped in Trump Tower before the victory, nothing found. This is McCarthyism. Um, no, it wouldn't be McCarthyism. It would, and you should know that because Roy Cohn was your mentor, uh, and he was the uh, counsel to <laughs> Senator Joe McCarthy. But okay, and then he says, "I bet a good lawyer can make a great case out of the fact that President Obama was tapping my phones in October, just prior to the election." Does he not realize he is the president of the United States? He's got every lawyer. Po- I mean, he he's got the entire Department of Justice. He's got he's got. Jeff Sessions as, as the attorney general, if he wants to see anything, he just asks and they bring it to him. I, I don't even understand what this is. How low, how low has President Obama gone to tap, T-A-P-P, to tap my phones during the very sacred? <laughs> I thought they were rigged. Now all of a sudden the sacred election process. Then he says, this is Nixon Watergate, which isn't McCarthyism. Bad or sick guy. Now, this is a guy who insists it's all rigged and still does, but it's all of a sudden a sacred election that is either Nixon breaking into the Democratic National Committee, which is, you know, more of a of an analogy of what's, you know, what's gone on here uh, than McCarthyism. I I just uh, I don't need. So anyway, uh, seconds after or or about 20 minutes after he tweets about having his wires tapped, T-A-P-P-E-D, he tweets Arnold Schwarzenegger isn't voluntarily leaving The Apprentice. He was fired by his bad, pathetic ratings. Not by me. Sad. (laughs) Sad end to great show. Now, if you hacked into Trump's Twitter to embarrass him, you couldn't do any better than this. I picture him walking around Mar-a-Lago at 6.30 in the morning, you know, like like Orson Welles right at the end of Citizen King, you know? His eyes are glazed and he's smashing things and it... It's actually a cool image, actually. So let's uh, let's set it aside. <laughs> okay, but I think I got this. I, I really do. So let me explain this to you as best as I can. There's a woman. Her name is Louise Mensch. Some of my listeners have been following her on Twitter. Be careful. But Louise Mensch works uh, for News Corp for a, a, a thing, a sheet called Heat Street. Okay, and that is run by Rupert Murdoch. On November 9th, she tweeted something very specific, very specific. And uh, of course, what, what got to Trump in this weird game of telephone through Breitbart and Mark Levin, uh, who, you know, the, the, the November 9th thing has been out there a really long time. I've seen it. 
Malcolm Nance has seen it. Plenty of people have seen it. Okay, we all know what it is. Uh, and so this thing that she tweeted on November 9th, the, the, the eve of the election, I guess, it, yeah, she published this story and she reported that a special intelligence court in Washington, the FISA court, right, had granted a warrant to allow the FBI to conduct surveillance of U.S. persons in an investigation of possible contacts between Russian banks and the Trump organization. That is what she put out there on November 9th. Now, of course, uh, they're looking to distract and deflect from the whole Sessions mess and the whole Flynn mess. And, you know, nobody wants to talk about why they had to resign (laughs) and why they had to recuse themselves. So instead, he, I guess they're trying to cheer him up. I'm not really sure. Uh, because he gets really, really angry. Tuesday, he was jubilant because he thought he had nailed his speech. Wednesday morning, he's floating on, you know, he's just floating around and he gets all this good press and his his aides are feeding him all this good. Look, they say you're presidential and look, they say you did such a good job and he's floating around. And then all of a sudden, what, like Wednesday night, uh, people are screaming for Jeff Sessions to recuse himself. Uh, Thursday morning, he gets, uh, you know, he, he goes to his, uh, you know, little uh, dog and pony show where he wears the flight suit and he wears the hat and he looks ridiculous. I mean, that that's a meme fest. That's just so fun. Uh, but anyway, he goes and he's overshadowed by Jeff Sessions recusing himself, taking away from his military moment, his commander in chief moment. And on top of that, turns out that he had just endorsed Sessions, said he had full confidence in him, he shouldn't recuse himself. Apparently Sessions, fearing the long arm of the law, recused himself based on his Republican friends in the Senate who said, this really stinks to high heaven, Jeff, you better put yourself out of this, you better get out of it now. So he doesn't tell President Trump that he's going to recuse himself, he just does it while the president is on you know, this aircraft carrier all dressed up. Like a fat version of George W. without the cod piece. And this sets him off. And by Friday, he is livid. He is throwing things. He is yelling. He made staffers cry. And Reince Priebus is on the phone for hours, hours, trying to kill the story, going, please, you have no idea what it would be like if you release the story. This man is insane, and we just can't take it. He's making everybody miserable. People are crying. People are walking out the door. We hardly have any staff left. Please don't tell how freaking off... The hook he is and unhinged he is. Okay, so that's what led up to Saturday morning's Twitter rant. I think what happened was Steve Bannon, who apparently is joined at the hip and sits behind closed doors with Donald Trump, telling him all this weird stuff about how the deep state, the intelligence community and the media and even some of his friends, they're all trying to ruin his presidency and you must deconstruct the government. You have to deconstruct the intelligence communities, the media, uh, the, 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 the way legislation works. Don't go through the normal channels. Don't go through legislation. Just executive order yourself you know, into, a, w- in, in, into the love that your fans, because they're not even people, you know, they're not even voters, they're just fans. The love that your fans have. And I think trying to make him feel better He called his friends at Breitbart and said, look, there's a story out there. It's been out there since November 9th. Why don't you write it up? I'll show it to the president. Breitbart writes up, but but completely tortures Louise Mensch's story, tortures it. And then uh, that Breitbart story is picked up by Mark Levin. There, I said it. The Maki Fishwife, you know him. Yeah, it's picked up by him and he mangles and mutilates it even further. Now, her original story was that the FBI had granted a FISA warrant covering Trump camp's ties to Russia because of bank, uh, bank banking activity at two Russian banks and a server somewhere in the United States. So that's what she writes. It comes out of Breitbart and interpreted by Mark Levin as there were wiretaps on the president's phone. <laughs> and Obama did it illegally. Because, you know, we've all learned the president can't order wiretaps on U.S. persons. But the FISA warrant apparently uh, was, you know, applied for earlier. It was applied for in July and it was rejected by the FISA court. Now, that that's reporting that was uh, uh, reported by various news organizations, which, of course, 
Mark Levin leaves out, Breitbart leaves out. But they reported it in the Washington Post. They reported it at BBC News. They reported it at um, the Guard- in The Guardian. And they reported it, uh, there was one other place that reported it, I forget. Okay, so that's widely reported that there, there, there was an application for a FISA warrant that was turned down. And then the scope of it was narrowed and it was granted. But it all had to do with banks, server to server activity. I think the thing that Louise Mensch, uh, you know, I I won't say she got it wrong because she didn't go this deep. She did assume, I think, that the server was in Trump Tower. Now, other reporting has said that the server that remember the server that they said was talking to this Russian bank, Alpha Bank. Uh, She she asserted that it was in Trump Tower. Other reportage indicates that that server is actually in Philadelphia because Trump had staffed out or contracted with a company to do email in Philadelphia and run that server that is based in Philadelphia. The company is called ListTrack, L-I-S-T-R-A-K, ListTrack. So I think that was the FISA warrant that was issued for the bank to bank, and they found that that was nothing. That there was no there there, uh, according to the leaks. Now, we don't know what anybody found because nobody can talk about this. Okay. Now, she's insisting that there was, or she's not insisting, she's alleging that there was a FISA warrant issued for Trump Tower. Now, here's why I think perhaps she's correct. Do you know who lives in Trump Tower besides for Trump? Paul Manafort lives in Trump Tower. And so this weekend when they were saying that this wasn't against the Trump campaign in in October, that could be legit. Now why? Paul Manafort left the campaign in August. But I, I do believe that Paul Manafort has always been under investigation by James Comey. I keep telling you that I believe that that's true. I take a lot of heat for saying that I believe James Comey's investigation into Manafort and his Russian ties and his crazy lobbying that he's been engaged in over all these years uh, isn't over. And everybody keeps saying, well, where is he? Where is Comey? And, you know, the more that you get into it, the more you realize how sensitive this investigation truly is. And the more you understand that they want every I dotted, every T crossed, every single transcript disseminated to the Intelligence Committee uh, without fear of leaks and that they want to do a complete and full investigation into Paul Manafort. Now, how did Paul Manafort end up living at Trump Tower? Well, Paul Manafort has been friends with Donald Trump. For decades, this outsider, Donald Trump, is such an insider, it's crazy. It's absolutely insane. Paul Manafort worked for a lobby shop that was raided. There was there's an article in my homework section today. It's called there's a section in there called the complete Manafort. And you can read through that. There's a Harper's Bazaar magazine article that actually was written years ago. Uh, based off of Spy Magazine's ratings of lobby shops. Spy Magazine rated the Manafort lobby shop, which is called Black Manafort Stone. Yes, Roger Stone. Yeah, Manafort and Roger Stone. And Kelly. And then later, Black Manafort Stone Kelly and Atwater. Lee Atwater. Yep. Yep. Now, here's how I imagine that they got, they got to know each other. Black Manafort, Stone, and Kelly, Paul Manafort of Black Manafort, Stone, and Kelly, raided one of the sleaziest lobby shops in the world, all, all over K Street, everywhere, in the world, by Spy Magazine and documented by Harper's Magazine. Actually, Paul Manafort himself got into some strange and horrible investigation uh, in New Jersey, Manafort allegedly used his connections at the White House in the late 1980s to the Reagan administration, his connections at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Maybe this is why a um, neurosurgeon, Dr. Ben Carson, has been put in charge of housing and urban development. It's just an interesting little thing. But according to uh, this story that was reported widely in New Jersey, Manafort used his connections at the White House to secure himself a $42 million rent subsidy and tax credit package 
for a housing project, Section 8 housing project in Seabrook, New Jersey. The local officials in New Jersey didn't know anything about this and they didn't want the money. But Manafort, as it turns out, was part owner of this Seabrook, New Jersey, Section 8 housing complex. And he double billed. Yes, he took $326,000 in cold hard cash and paid himself as the lobbyist for his own Section 8 housing building. And then he lobbied the government to get $42 million in rent subsidies and tax credits. When he testified in front of Congress about this, he said um, that... This was in a subcommittee hearing in 1989. He said, quote, you could characterize this as influence peddling. (laughs) But all the subcommittee ended up doing was chastising him for the politically well-connected cashing in on a program set up to benefit low-income families. The final report on the Seabrook uh, disaster uh, referred to the program as a cash cow milked by the politically well-connected. Well, I'll bet you anything, Donald Trump, who was in the cas- was entering into the casino business at that time, heard about Paul Manafort bilking very poor people in Section 8 housing in New Jersey, kicking them out of the housing and getting all these tax credits and subsidies, you know, rent subsidies from the government and then saying, yeah, and I even paid myself to lobby the government to get those and I was really benefiting myself. Uh, I guess he said, wow, that guy's freaking brilliant, fantastic, terrific, get him on the phone. And so Manafort does, I don't know who contacts who, I'm guessing Trump contacts Manafort back in the early 90s, and he hires Paul Manafort. Why? Because he needed a guy like that when he started lobbying for Atlantic, for his Atlantic City casinos, he wanted the Indian gaming, the Indians, to be put out of business so they would not compete with his casinos. So he hires Black Manafort, Stone, and Kelly. Manafort is the lobbyist, and Stone is the operator, okay? Roger Stone, actually, he spent thousands of dollars on ads to discredit the Indians, the Indian casino gaming. He took these sinister photos of drug paraphernalia. In these commercials, he alleged that the St. Regis Mohawk Indians had connections to criminal activity, which is hysterical because Trump did. And the governor at the time in New York, George Pataki, fined Donald Trump and Roger Stone $250,000 for doing this. And the one that was handling the account uh, was Roger Stone. But Paul Manafort was involved in some capacity and he was pitching in and uh, establishing a relationship with Trump that would pay off decades later. That's just the tip of the iceberg. So this is how they know each other, the Manafort and the Trump. goes back decades. Now, Manafort does currently live in Trump Tower. Now, Louise Mensch never said phone tapping, ever in any of these reports. What she does say is that a FISA warrant was issued and that it was, uh, you know, a a, a FISA warrant that included U.S. persons involved in banking uh, uh, around Trump. Now, if Manafort left in August, he's not part of the Trump campaign, so legitimately Clapper can say, which is what he said on TV, that there was no, uh, there was no, uh, first of all, there's no wiretap, there's no phone wiretap, right? Uh, and that it had nothing to do with anybody in the Trump campaign in October, that could be true. Because Manafort leaves in August, right? Now, Chris Coons goes on TV this weekend and says there are transcripts of conversations. That means phone. But all the evidence points to the Baltic states. Like I said, if you lived in Estonia, a place I've been, I've told you this a million times, and you find out that Manafort's on the phone talking to the Russians, you might tell the U.S. government. You just might do that. And then no laws are broken because you're in Estonia. (laughs) You see what I mean? Now, Trump can know all of this. If he wants to know it, he can know it. Apparently, he doesn't want to know it or he does know it and he doesn't want it coming out. But he's asked for an investigation. So let's have one. Clear for takeoff. Randy Rhodes. 
Air Force. Air, Air, Air Force. RandyRoads.com. Go to RandyRoads.com for the whole thing and a podcast. Buy a stinking podcast.